Hi, I'm Dr. James Flaherty of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute. Uh, welcome to the first annual Heart Team Summit here in Chicago. I am here today with my colleague, Dr. Rania Swayce, also an interventional cardiologist. Today we're going to talk about TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, in low risk patients. Dr. Swayce, welcome. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about what TAVR and low risk patients means to you. So TAVR has been an exciting um, medical advancement over the past 11 years that we've been um, had an opportunity to treat patients that have had no other options. And the natural progression of um, research and um, scientific advancement is to continue to push uh, the limits. And the most recent uh, trial uh, data that was published was in the low-risk patients. Um, the question was when we can get a low-risk patient through a surgery really well and give them a very good result, can TAVR beat that or at least be equivalent? And I think many of us in the interventional world were hoping that at least it would be equivalent. And uh, we're very pleasantly surprised that um, in the low-risk um, population of patients, uh, TAVR actually bested surgery in um, overall outcomes for patients in the low-risk category. So this seems like a major paradigm shift uh, away from surgical ABR in many patients with aortic stenosis. Um, patients are going to come to us probably wanting this therapy because it's less invasive. Who should still get surgery? for at least for aortic stenosis in your view? Yeah, so who is a low risk patient? Well, there's a low risk 30 year old with a bicuspid valve who's had that since birth. Um, there's a low risk 62 year old who only has, uh, may also have bicuspid valve disease or maybe one of those patients with a tri-leaflet valve that has early stenosis. Um, those patients are not the same. And um, I think that probably this data has made it much easier to make the decision for the 62 year old low risk patient and say, you know, if that patient's preferring um, a less invasive uh, intervention and they don't have any other reason to have uh, SAVR, they don't have concomitant disease um, or, or um, concomitant coronary disease that may require a bypass, those patients um, can go ahead and have TAVR. Now the question, of course, um, is what do we do with the low uh, risk young patients um, who presumably are gonna have many more years of life and um, the long term, as in 50 year durability of the TAVR valve or TAVR procedure overall, um, is still not been clarified. That's a great uh, point. A lot of patients come to me and come to you and say, if I have TAVR or surgery, how long is the valve going to last? What, how do you answer that question when a patient asks you, how long is my valve going to last? Um, in general, we think of bioprosthetic valves as lasting about 10 to 15 years. Um, of course, we're using uh, data from the surgical population of patients who've had bioprosthetic valves for many years. Um, we are not quite at the 10 to 15, or we're kind of pushing that 10 to 15 uh, year range now on the early valves, but that's the point. It's, it's also the earlier generation valves and not the current valve that we're using. So there is some question um, about the long-term durability of our valves. Um, we know that there are some issues uh, relating to valve thrombosis that we're seeing more, um, that we are um, treating with anticoagulation and probably need to learn more about uh, why are our patients having more valve thrombosis? Um, how do we screen for it? What is the optimal um, either anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy after TAVR um, in order to minimize it as much as possible? You mentioned that low risk patients may be younger. You said early 60s may be good for TAVR. Um, you said that the life, life of the valve may be 10 to 15 years. So now we're reaching patients who are probably going to outlive their valve What's going to happen in that patient in 15 years? What do you tell them, or do we not know yet? Well, we're starting to see some patients who are coming, the early patients from the early trials um, are having some bioprosthetic valve failure and are coming for a uh, valve in valve or TAVR in TAVR um, procedure. Um, and that's a great opportunity or option, um, but there probably needs to be newer platforms that are aimed directly at treating um, TAVR failures. Um, so I think we definitely need to see these platforms that are going to help us treat our patients better. Um, there's also, it's also going to have to um, not significantly increase the, you know, the post-procedure gradients. And so we need to uh, keep that into consideration as well. So maybe, maybe there's technology we don't have yet that'll be available yeah. for patients exactly. in 10 or 15 years. And sometimes we have a pragmatic conversation with a patient. I've had a few patients who are in their mid-50s 
knowing that they're going to need multiple valves and probably need surgery at some point, have elected to have their TAVR procedure now while they're active and working because they didn't want to miss you know, time out of their work, and knowing that in 10 years, 10 to 15 years, they may need to have surgery, but they're still going to be relatively low risk. The other caveat that we're going to have to consider is also um, since a lot of the young patients or the low risk patients um, have bicuspid valve and probably have aortopathies, um, how do we uh, screen and monitor the aorta enlargement in the patients with bicuspid valve and the timing for that intervention as well. Now, some patients are going to come to you and say, I heard you need a pacemaker if you get a TAVR. What do you tell them? I tell them that uh, there is a risk of that. Um, probably in the literature, the risk is between 10 and 15% of needing a pacemaker post-TAVR. Um, although that's probably higher in older patients and lower in younger patients, although not 100%. Um, in comparatively open heart surgery or SAVR, um, the risk is probably in the 8 to 10% range. And so there's a slightly higher risk uh, of pacemaker in uh, TAVR, and that's probably going to be a significant consideration uh, for younger patients who do not want to have a pacemaker placed. And what do you tell patients who say, uh, stroke is my biggest fear, it's even a bigger fear than death in some people? Um, how do you address that? Um, well, interestingly, in the low risk study, there was a signal for um, less stroke in the TAVR patients as well, um, uh, similar to the overall um, improved outcomes for the low risk patients with TAVR. Um, we uh, currently, the practice is to assess the patient's risk for stroke. If they've had a prior stroke, they're obviously a high risk for another stroke. If they have other comorbid conditions like atrial fibrillation, they may be at increased risk. Or if they have mobile densities in their um, aorta suggesting they have a lot of atherosclerosis. And on a patient by patient basis, especially um, knowing what their anatomy is, uh, we can consider using uh, embolic protection devices or cerebral protection devices to um, help decrease the risk of um, stroke in this population. Well, it's certainly an exciting area. Probably a, we're in a place where we didn't think we would be 10 years ago even. Um, thanks for illustrating all the uh, nuances of TAVR and low-risk patients and the possible impact it may have yeah. on our patients. I want to thank everyone for coming to our meeting. Next year, the Heart Team Summit is going to be in St. Louis in October. So we hope that everyone had a good experience and hope to see you next year. Thank you.